Welcome to science class. Today we are going to learn about metamorphic rocks. When we covered minerals, we discussed the four ways minerals form. Rocks are made from minerals, so the processes that produce minerals are the same processes that produce rocks. Crystallization from magma produces only igneous rocks. Precipitation reactions produce only sedimentary rocks. Heat and pressure and hydrothermal solutions, the final two processes, produce only metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks are the products of pre-existing rocks having their chemical composition altered. I've said this many times before, but our goal in this course is to be able to learn about and interpret our planet, and metamorphic rocks, like anything else, allow us to do that, as long as you know what to look for. Let's get started. As I just said, metamorphic rocks are produced when pre-existing rocks are subjected to either intense heat and pressure or by hydrothermal solution. Virtually all metamorphic rocks are produced several kilometers below the surface. For this reason, metamorphic rocks only make up around 12% of the surface. The temperatures required for metamorphism are typically greater than 200 degrees Celsius and the pressure greater than 1000 bars. How much pressure is a thousand bars? Well, it's almost exactly one ton per square centimeter. Your pinky nail is pretty close to a square centimeter. So imagine one ton, a thousand kilograms, over 2,200 pounds pushing on that. That's what conditions are like underneath so many kilometers of solid crust. Some of the temperatures that produce metamorphic rocks are hot enough to normally melt rocks on the surface but the added massive amounts of pressure prevent the rock from actually melting. But the intense heat allows the atoms within the rock structure to more easily recombine into new mineral forms. There are three basic types of metamorphism. The first is contact metamorphism. This occurs when rocks are altered by nearby magma. The degree of metamorphism is greater the closer to the source of magma. One rock type may actually go through several stages of metamorphism with increasing temperatures. Shale, which is compressed mud, can become gneiss, nice, but if the temperatures are not quite high enough or the amount of time is not long enough, it may instead metamorphosize into slate, phyllite, or schist. Limestone can be altered into marble at its lowest metamorphic state, but its mineral content can further rearrange to form calcite, chlorite, and serpentine at even higher temperatures, or garnets and diopside at even greater temperatures still. The next type of metamorphism is called regional metamorphism. Contact metamorphism was more about heat, regional metamorphism is more about pressure. Rocks can do very strange things when they are subjected to the unbelievable pressure that we described earlier. I want to show you some sedimentary rock formations and then compare them to metamorphic rock formations. See if you can see the difference. Here's a sedimentary rock formation. Now here's a metamorphic rock formation. Sedimentary, metamorphic. Sedimentary, metamorphic. You see, when sediments are laid down, you always get horizontal layers of sediment. This is called original horizontality, and we'll go into more depth with it when we cover historical geology. There is no way that sediments can be laid down with these waves and curves. This is the telltale sign of regional metamorphism. When you subject solid rocks to the unthinkable pressure caused by two sections of the lithosphere crashing into one another, or by the sheer weight of 10, 20, 50 or 100 kilometers of solid rock pushing down, those rocks start to do strange things. They can become altered as if they are clay. This is what regional metamorphism is. Minerals that are already present are also forced to recrystallize into new forms. And so a funny thing can happen during regional metamorphism. As the rock is squeezed, its mineral crystals not only can rearrange into new ones, but they can also realign so that they all face in the same direction. Mica schist is schist that is high in the mineral mica. I know, right? Mica is actually a group of minerals. Muscovite belongs to this group, and we've studied muscovite before. You'll remember that it can be peeled into thin sheets. If you try to apply force to one of its sides, it breaks apart and peels. 
but it's very strong if you apply force to another one of its sides. This is the result of regional metamorphism. All of the molecules have organized themselves in one direction, which causes these weak spots. When the minerals recrystallize along these planes, the rock sometimes exhibits these alternating bands. When the rock was a mixture of minerals, all pointing and orientated in random directions, well, there's no separating one mineral from the other. But when they orientate themselves in the same direction, stripes of one mineral become distinct from others. This is called foliation, and it's how metamorphic rocks are classified. Foliated metamorphic rocks have these distinct bands, while non-foliated rocks do not. Gneiss, phyllite, and mica schist are examples of foliated metamorphic rocks. Marble and quartzite are examples of non-foliated metamorphic rocks. The third way of producing metamorphic rocks is through hydrothermal solution. This is exactly the same process we outlined when we covered how minerals are produced. But again, superheated water carries with it minerals or metals that are in solution. That water makes its way through cracks in rocks or the porous nature of the rocks themselves and cements new minerals within the rock. This is not as extreme as the heat and pressure we have just covered, but it does introduce new minerals into the rock, changing its composition. Therefore, it is metamorphism. So we have used igneous and sedimentary rocks to interpret Earth's history in different ways. And we can do the same thing with metamorphic rocks too. Metamorphic rocks are pretty distinct. The warping that is plainly visible on their surface is one giveaway. Mount Rushmore is carved into a granite peak, but its base is metamorphic rock. You can see what's known as an unconformity between these two layers of completely different rock. This represents two distinct periods in Earth's history, with one sitting on top of the other. We also know what the conditions are that form different minerals. When we find gemstones and minerals and whatever else on the surface that we know could not have been produced without the intense heat and pressure of metamorphism, we know that those particular minerals or rocks originally formed deep within the earth and very slowly were brought towards the surface. Now I want to tell you a story about a little coral reef. This will make more sense shortly. This coral reef lived probably hundreds of millions of years ago and existed for probably tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Corals take in nutrients from the water and cement their own minerals into the shallow sea floor. That's what the bulk of a reef is. But reefs never stop growing, and they eventually build on top of the structure built by corals from many generations ago. After a very long time, the mineral buildup from this coral and many other microscopic organisms became buried and then compacted. This is what forms limestone. The shifting lithosphere later buried the limestone deeper into the lithosphere, where cooling igneous rocks transformed that limestone into marble. After more eons, still the marble was exposed to the surface in Carrera, Italy. Quarry workers extracted a section of the marble, and an artist named Michelangelo transformed this block of the earth, hundreds of millions of years in the making, into the Statue of David one of the most iconic works of art ever produced. This is the rock cycle. Well, kind of. Any rock can be transformed into another rock through various geological processes. But here's a good question. What was Earth's first rock? If you remember planetary formation, you'll remember that Earth was molten all the way up to its surface during and after its formation. So the first rock had to be igneous rock, but which one? Well, since it formed on the surface, it had to be an extrusive igneous rock, and since it was formed from crystallized lava, it was almost certainly basalt. The entire surface of Earth, when it first stabilized, was 100% basalt. So how did it ever transform into other rocks? Keep in mind that because of Earth system science, even rocks interact with and are changed by their environment. As basalt is driven deeper into the Earth, weaker minerals present in the basalt melt and they rise to the surface. These weaker minerals form new rocks like granite. Metamorphism can happen at any point from heat and pressure and sedimentary rocks started to form as the planet slowly collected its oceans and then weathering and erosion began taking place. Now that is the rock cycle. 
and that does it for rocks. Next time, we will begin learning about a different type of resource on our planet, energy resources. Thanks for watching.